Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome from Stuttgart, actually. Uh, this is the Hospital of Stuttgart. My name is Monica Renninger, and I'm the director of this um, center. And we would have loved to have you with us in Stuttgart, uh, which was not possible now, but uh, luckily everybody else is coming not from Stuttgart here right now, but from Berlin, Munich, and wherever you are. So that's a very great advantage uh, of being, get, going online and being connected uh, through that. Um, words of welcome also from my colleague from the German American Center in Stuttgart, Christiane Püka. And uh, the two of us, we are the hosts for the American Academy events in Stuttgart. And usually uh, this is a very good um, uh, idea to be together and to talk together. And uh, now we're participating this way. And um, I think that's the best we can make uh, of the, at the moment. And there are very many people here right now. So it's great to have you all with us. And we hopefully be in Stuttgart at, one, at another point uh, and another time. So the interpretive remarks will be made by Berit of uh, Ebert from the American Academy. And this is yours, Berit. Thank you so much, uh, Monica, and uh, welcome um, everybody to our discussion uh, about America's Black queer history. My name is Berit Ebert. I'm the Vice President of Programs here at the American Academy in Berlin, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to this event, which is part of a series that is called Head to Head, a meeting of inspired minds. And believe me, you will meet two very inspired minds today. Um, it has been taking place uh, as a cooperation between the American Academy in Berlin, the Deutsche Amerikanisches Zentrum in Stuttgart, and the Evangelisches Bildungszentrum Hospitalhof in Stuttgart. Um, thank you for um, having been partners with us for such a long time. It has been a pleasure to work with you. It will be a pleasure to work with you, and we look forward to continuing um, more interesting and, uh, endeavors in the future. Um, in addition to our Stuttgart partners, I would also like to thank the Deutsch Amerikanisches Institut Tübingen for their help in promoting this event. Uh, welcome on board. Um, Stuttgart is, as Monika said, normally the place where we would be, and we would be actually sitting in a pleasant lecture room in the Bildungszentrum Hospitalhof, which has kindly hosted the events for so many times. Thank you again. Instead, we're meeting online today and uh, today. And while this is due to the fact um, that um, getting together in person is not yet as easy as in pre-pandemic times, this online meeting enables us to host Gero Bauer, one of our speakers today, and he is actually cur currently in the US where he teaches at the University of Maryland this semester. Um, it is a real treat to have you here with us, Gero, and uh, thank you for, for agreeing to come and be, be part of this. I would also like to thank the supporters of this uh, series, the Berthold Leibinger Stiftung, Robert Bosch Stiftung, and the Holzbring Publishing Group, um, who make the, these series of discussions possible. Um, if you are um, among the very, very sad people who don't know what the American Academy is, um, I uh, will now uh, say a brief words about, about the Academy. We're a center for advanced studies located right next uh, or on the shores of Lake Wannsee. I will spare you the view because you would be totally envying me. Um, and here we host about 25 fellows uh, per year. Um, fellows devote their, um, their time to working on a project. They pursue their research from the humanities and social science, uh, from fiction and the arts. And during their time here at, uh, at the Academy in Berlin, uh, fellows usually give public lectures here and elsewhere. Um, one of our fellows this semester is uh, Channing Joseph, currently the Holzbring Fellow here at the Academy. Um, he teaches at the University of, uh, of Southern California's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, and has also worked at Oberlin College and the State University of New York, Plattsburgh. Um, Channing has lectures widely on narrative nonfiction, journalism, early LGBTQ history, diversity, inclusion, and access and education at the workplace, as well as African American history, literature, and gene genealogy. Um, but this is, of course, not all that Channing is. Channing is, uh, is so many perfect um, individuals. Um, careers, uh, it's, it's really impressive. One of his career has been taking place as a journalist. And Channing has been the first to break news on a number of major stories, including we, uh, the WikiLeaks publication of secret military documents from the war in Afghanistan 
in 2007. He has published in the New York Times, the International Herald Review, the New York Sun, Washington Post, The Guardian, and The Atlantic, among others. Um, as an editor, he shaped the work of two dozen Pulitzer Prize winners, and as a Holtzbring Fellow here at the American Academy, Channing has been working on his project, House of Swan, where slaves became queens and changed the world. You will hear more about this project in a minute. The other distinguished guest uh, for tonight is Dero Bauer, who teaches English Literature and Cultural Studies at the University of Tübingen and is the Managing Director of Tübingen Center for Gender and Diversity Research. Um, since the publication of his first monograph, Houses, Secrets, and the Closet, Locating Masculinities from the Gothic Novel to Henry James, which was published in 2016, he has been working on a new book project entitled Hope and Kinship in Contemporary Fiction. Um, he has published on early modern natural philosophy, gender and literature, queer film and television, and queer pedagogies, and he has been a visiting scholar at the University of Cambridge and King's College in London. In the fall uh, term of 2021, which is this term, uh, he's a visiting professor at the University of Maryland at College Park, as I said before. Um, but there's also one, several more aspects to this biography. I want to mention one uh, very exciting one, actually, and a very recent one that was uh, just uh, public a few days ago. Gero will be the new head of the Magnus Hirschfeld, Hirschfeld Foundation starting in early 2022. Uh, congratulations, Gero. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, that's well-deserved. Um, before I give the screen over to Gero and Channing, allow me to explain how you all can ask questions tonight. Um, you will see on the, uh, on the bottom of your screen a Q&A uh, in German of F and A uh, bottom, where you can, um, that you can click on and you can submit your questions there. Um, the raise hand function will not work and uh, so neither will the chat function work. So please use, use the Q&A function. Gero will then read the questions. Um, Monica and I are not uh, unpolite when we will disappear now. We just want to make sure that you see the two most important people of, uh, of this evening and this is Channing and uh, Gero Channing. The virtual screen is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um amazing introduction, um, Barrett. Um, I um, would like to reintroduce myself a little bit. My name is Channing Gerard Joseph. It's my great honor to be the Holtzbrink Fellow here at the Academy, American Academy in Berlin this fall. Um, I'm a longtime journalist for publications ranging from the New York Times to The Guardian to The Nation, and um, my work has focused on race and social justice. Um, I'm also, also a lecturer at the University of Southern California. Um, since my field is journalism, I'm interested in telling compelling, factually accurate stories for a mass audience. Um, in my recent work, I seek to recover the forgotten lives and cultural practices of 19th and early 20th century Black queer communities. Um, communities whose histories have largely been erased from public memory and from much of current scholarship. Um, I'm also interested in the ways that journalists, because I'm a journalist, uh, I'm interested in the ways that journalists have historically caricatured, misrepresented, or ignored those communities and how those erasures and distortions have negatively affected Black queer Americans' health, liberty, economic opportunity, and ability to participate in civic society. Um, in this work, I make the case that including the stories of Black queer Americans is critical to providing an accurate reckoning of American history at large. Um, because much of my research focuses on a period of history when modern identity terms such as gay, bisexual, lesbian, transgender, um, and others had either not been coined or were not used in the same ways that, as they are today. Um, that's why I'm using the term queer. Um, I use the term queer in its most inclusive sense, embracing those whose gender identities and poor sexual behavior were considered either divergent or deviant for their time um, because they obviously could not use the terms we use today. In particular, um, I've, I'm seeking to shed light on slavery, the Civil War, Reconstruction, Prohibition, and other major historical eras um, in American history by reintegrating the experiences of Black queer people whose roles in those events have been obscured. 
For my, for my project at the Academy this fall, I'm working on a book that unearths the forgotten history of a particular community of formerly enslaved queer Americans and the lingering impact of their contributions on American culture and politics. The book, which is called House of Swan, where slaves became queens and changed the world, forthcoming from Crown, um, tells the story of William Dorsey Swan, um, a Maryland born former slave who became the world's first self-described drag queen and one of the earliest known LGBTQ plus activists. Um, one of the most significant ways I believe that my research breaks new ground is by making use of historical newspaper coverage that has been largely ignored by other scholars. In many cases, archival newspapers uh, are the only extant sources for critical details um, about Swan and the community that, um, that he built in Washington, D.C. in the late, late 19th century. Such details um, have allowed me to build a rich picture of the underground queer community of Washington, D.C., its members, and their connections to powerful political circles, including those of American presidents, military leaders, and advocates such as Frederick Douglass, who, as U.S. Marshal for D.C., was tasked with protecting city inmates, including those arrested for deviant sexual behavior and gender expression. Let me paint a picture for you. Imagine it's April 12th, 1888, when the police burst through the door of the two-story residence in Northwest Washington, DC, just half a mile from the White House, they discovered dozens of black men dancing together there, wearing silk and satin dresses made according to the latest fashions of 1888. Most of them were slaves, most of them were former slaves or the children of slaves. As soon as the party goers saw the officers, the dancing suddenly stopped. Uh, instead, the attendees looked on in shock for a brief moment before scurrying to make their getaway. Many of them, the newspapers later reported, struggled to strip off their garments, their ribbons, and their wigs of long wavy hair. Others raced immediately to the back doors or leapt out of second floor windows and onto the roofs of nearby buildings. The sound of shattering glass awakened the neighbors as one unfortunate guest crashed through a skylight. William Dorsey Swan, the self-proclaimed queen of the gathering, had no intention of running away. It was his 30th birthday celebration. And according to the Washington Post, he was arrayed in a gorgeous dress of cream colored satin. Unlike the others, he ran frantically toward the officers in a vain attempt to keep them from entering the room. The queen stood in an attitude of royal defiance, the National Republican newspaper noted on its front page. Bursting with rage as he stared down the invaders, Swan told them haughtily, you is no gentleman. A brawl ensued and his handsome gown was torn to shreds. Half naked, he was then taken to jail and charged with the crime of being a suspicious character. It is safe to assert, one commentator wrote after the raid, that the number living as do those who were taken into custody last night must be exceedingly small. In the year 2021, it's easy to forget that in the late 19th century, hardly anyone had ever laid eyes on men in dresses. That is why the Post observed, the Washington Post observed, there was considerable excitement on the streets and a crowd of about 400 people followed the prisoners to the station house. Drag queens were more than a novelty in the 1880s. They were a shock to the system. The surprise raid of April 12, 1888 was neither the first nor the last time that William Dorsey Swan was carried away in the police wagon for organizing drag balls in private homes in the nation's capital. But his decision to fight that night rather than to submit passively to his arrest marks one of the earliest known instances of violent resistance in the name of what we now understand as LGBTQ plus rights. Beginning as early as 1882, Swan was the first person to dub himself a queen of drag, the first to create an organization for queer liberation, and the first to urge members of his queer community to fight for their rightful place in the country that they and their ancestors had helped to build. In addition, in 1896, Swan became the first and only known activist to seek a presidential pardon after being arrested and convicted for holding a drag event. 
My residency here at the American Academy is significant for my work because some of the earliest known LGBTQ plus activists were Germans. Carl Maria Kirchmeny, who first coined the term homosexual. Carl Heinrich Ulrichs, who campaigned in the 1860s for the repeal of anti-LGBTQ plus laws. And Magnus Hirschfeld, who founded the Scientific Humanitarian Committee, one of the first LGBTQ plus rights organizations in the world. These and other German figures were very influential in shaping early thought on sexuality and LGBTQ plus advocacy globally. Spending time in the archives in Berlin and in conversation with German scholars, I hope will enrich my project immeasurably and, and allow me to place the contributions of queer Americans into a more international context. In 1900 and beyond, after Swan, Walter William Dorsey Swan's retirement from the drag scene, his brother Daniel J. Swan continued the family tradition in Washington. He provided costumes for the drag community there for roughly five decades until his death in 1954, through the rise and fall of notable Black DC drag queens like Alden Garrison and Mother Louis Diggs. The term queen, though loosely used today, um, though, though it was, it's used loosely today, much more loosely. The term queen was used until the 1960s um, only for a person in a position of honor and leadership in the community, which makes sense. Um, though the story of Swan and his community is a significant one, it is certainly not the only example of how Black queer people have been influential in American history and culture. Some other early examples um, that I like to talk about um, are Mary Jones, Peter Swally, Francis Thompson, and Mother Louis Diggs. In the mid 1830s, a person who used various names, including Peter Swally, Mary Jones, um, Anna Eliza Evans, and Julia Johnson, um, who a person who was a free black person born in New York City came to that person came to the attention of the local press. Sawali so was dubbed Beefsteak Pete and the Man Monster after several arrests for sex work and theft. Largely represented by journalists as a lone individual rather than as a member of a community, others who failed to abide by 19th century gender norms were often compared to, to Sawali so in the press for the next several decades. Years later, after the Civil War had left the nation in shambles, a disabled former slave named Francis Thompson became central to the radical Republicans' efforts to institute policies to protect the lives and rights of newly free people who were facing a violent backlash from angry whites in the South. During the Memphis riots of 1866, Thompson, who had been assigned male at birth, was sexually assaulted by a group of white men. She then testified about her harrowing experience before a congressional committee, helping to bolster the government's case for reconstruction and the eventual passage of the 14th Amendment. Things drastically changed in 1876 when she again came to the attention of the Memphis police, who then forced her to undergo an examination of her genitalia. Not only was this yet another sexual violation for Thompson, who was arrested and jailed as a quote, man, unquote, but the development led to nationwide headlines decrying Thompson as a quote, fraud, unquote. Such headlines became fodder for those seeking to discredit her 1866 congressional testimony and to bring an end to reconstruction and the federal protections that it had provided for newly emancipated black citizens. And then in the 1920s and 30s, Mother Louis Stig, the prominent black drag queen in Washington, DC, played an important role during and after pre-prohibition. Diggs promoted greater awareness and openness to queerness in mainstream culture, not only by appearing in nightclub shows, but by publishing an essay in defense of queerness in a national newspaper. It is one of the earliest known explicit defenses of cross-dressing and same-sex attraction. It is also the first known explicit defense by a black writer and the first known public defense of Black queer people. Diggs and other Black queens served a cr crucial cultural and economic role at the time as well, as bar owners depended on what, what were then called uh, female impersonators um, to attract what the African-American journalist Ralph Matthews called amu amusement-starved patrons. In doing so, Matthews observed, they encouraged, quote, open acceptance 
of a brand of social sordidness, which was repulsive, but a short time ago, unquote. Today, more than a century after William Dorsey Swan's last known ball, the houses of the contemporary ballroom scene maintain the same basic format as the House of Swans. The, the balls feature competitive walking dances with exaggerated pantomime, exaggerated pantomime gestures, and they're organized around family-like groups led by mothers and queens. There are even some um, great houses here locally in Berlin. Um, Though the Stonewall Uprising of 1969 is often touted as the beginning of the fight for queer liberation, Swan's courageous example forces us to rethink the history of the movement, when it began, where it came from, and who its leaders were. Coming of age at a time when an entirely new form of freedom and self-determination was developing for African Americans, Swan and his house of butlers, coachmen, and cooks the first Americans to regularly hold cross-dressing balls and the first to fight for the right to do so, helped to lay the crucial foundations of self-acceptance, solidarity, courage, and confidence that eventually made Stonewall, LGBTQ plus pride and marriage equality possible more than a hundred years later. And I will leave it there. And Gero, um, um, where would you like to go from here? Well, thank you so much, Channing. And uh, again, hello from me. Um, this uh, is just so wonderful that I'm getting the opportunity to uh, get an insight into this work that you're doing. Um, also, uh, you know, being here in Maryland and very close to DC, you know, that where all this was taking place seems such an interesting, uh, well, coincidence. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm curious to hear more. Um, I, I do know that you've brought some um, visual material as well, but maybe before we go into that and uh, continue the conversation from there, I would be curious to hear, and I think everybody else will also be curious to hear a bit more about like how did you, you know, how did you come across this? How did you get, um, how did you come across the material? How did you get engaged? Um, why is this also maybe, why is it, important for you personally um just you know why do you want to write this story some of that will be answered by the visual material but but i will say that um that um um it comes from a, a desire to tell um a desire to find my place in in history it started with an obsession with genealogy um, actually, it's it's a great point for me to just share the the slides. I think I think this would be good you go. <laughs> so, okay, you guys know this already. We're in a talk called America's Black Queer History, <laughs> um, um, and this is a quote that I think about a lot as I as I'm working on this book. It's a, by Margaret Atwood. We were the people who were not in the papers. <laughs> we lived in the blank white spaces at the edges of, pr of print. Um, it's a little bit of a contradiction because I do find I find our I find black queer people like myself in the papers um, just usually not um, not centered in the way that uh, we might have been, or given the respect we might have been given. Um, so this is sort of the kernel of the answer to your question, Gero, about why I'm interested in this story. I was obsessed with this idea of of finding. Um, my place in American history, learning about what my ancestors, my black, particularly black ancestors, um, had endured in the United States. Um, and uh, this is not something that many African Americans know about because it's uh, most of the documents have been have there, there. There were oftentimes there were no documents, and oftentimes those documents were destroyed. Um, or not passed on to descendants. So it's very difficult for African-Americans sometimes to find uh, connections to slavery. In any event, I became obsessed with trying to do this and I, and I found some great material, um, including these two documents. The one on the left is, is from um, a slave auction in 1843. You, you sort of can sort of make out that there are names written down with prices next to them. And, and in certain places, uh, names have been scratched out because these are bidders who've been outbid by another bidder for, um, for the people on auction. Um, and among those people are, are and several ancestors of mine, including um, 
for people with their names Gaspar, Edouard, and Edmund. Um, and on the right is um, a newspaper post, a newspaper ad for another auction from 1820. Um, and the person listed their name Stephen is um, through um, lots of research, I discovered that that person named Stephen is, um, is an ancestor of mine. Um, and he is the father of the, the sons who are being sold in the auction on the left. So um, the, anyway, I became obsessed with this, but I realized as I was building sort of, you know, a family tree to document all of, all of this great history, that a family tree is typically woman, man, child, woman, man, child. Um, where does a queer person fit in that kind of family tree? It's a heterosexual, it's documentation of heterosexual behavior. Um, where would I fit in such a tree? So this one obsession actually, uh, when it hit, when it came in contact with this question, went in a whole different, it was like, you know, billiard balls popping, uh, hitting each other and going in different directions. I was sitting in another direction because I became obsessed with this idea of what does a queer ancestor look like? What would it be? And so I, I just started using the same sorts of, um, you know, the same sorts of research uh, uh, tactics, you know, going through census records and, and birth records and death records and, and newspaper records, don't forget that. Um, I sort of just looking for evidence of queerness in the past and looking for evidence of particularly Black queer people of, of the past. Um, that led me to this article which I found in an online database, uh, Columbia University, where I had been a student. And um, um, this article shocked me because I, it's talking about a drag ball. It's talking about a police raid on a drag ball, which in itself was not necessarily shocking, but the date is shocking. It's April, 1888. <laughs> and um, I had no idea that such balls existed, let alone that they were being raided, let alone that they were being created and led by Black men. Um, and um, I was convinced for a long time that someone else must know about this and be working on it. And, and then eventually, because I was obsessed and I kept sort of wanting to learn more about it, um, I realized that I had to be the person to pursue the topic. Um, do you have another question you'd like, or sort of we can we can stop sharing the slides now and and go back to regular questions. <laughs> no, I mean this is really interesting. I mean, if you have anything else to share, just you know, let me know whenever uh, <laughs> okay. whenever it fits. Um, I mean, one of the things that that I find really interesting about what you said there, and also I've had the great pleasure of um, reading some excerpts from you know the the book in progress. And, you know, it is this idea, um, maybe before we get talking about like larger questions of history and historiography, um, this idea of family and genealogy and descent, because um, what struck me, one of the things that struck me from the story and your account of it was that um, at there, you described this one scene of uh, where one of the balls is raided and two of um, Swan's siblings are also there. They also mm -hmm. cross dress, and then there is his sister um, mm -hmm. who seems to support them as well. So, um, how do you like? How do you write this story between the tension? The, so, the tension between you know the idea of a family of origin, which is kind of very you know heterosexual, and also has you know of course a special place on a complicated place within the history of, you know, within African American history and, and slavery, etc. And this idea of the chosen family, which, you know, within Swan's life, at least seems to, you know, how like both ideas seem to have come together because the siblings were still there and they were also really a part of this. Uh, but then he, also, he also had this, this chosen family, which is, you know, still such a strong idea in contemporary ball culture as well. Absolutely, it's it, it surprised me a great deal because I, I I when I first saw that I assumed that there was a mistake or that uh, that the people you know the siblings were were just friends who were using Swan's last name as a kind of act of solidarity, 
Um, but actually, no, they, they, they really do have a say by say. So um, it, it took quite a while to, to, to actually confirm that and figure that out um, uh, because this research is really hard. But, um, but um, you know, Swan had come to DC from a very small town um, in Northern Maryland on the border of, of West Virginia and Pennsylvania. Um, near what was called the Mason-Dixon line, which is the line between the free states and the slave states. And um, he came to Washington, D.C. seeking economic opportunity to help his family out. He'd, he'd come from a lar very large family, um, I think 13 siblings total. Um, and his parents were formerly enslaved people uh, who were trying to, you know, keep keep a roof over their heads, uh, you know, as farmers in this rural town. Um, and so he came to Washington DC seeking opportunity. And once he'd sort of established himself in Washington DC, um, his younger siblings came and he was, was essentially, you know, their, their caretaker, um, you know, and um, I think that's interesting because it puts him in a position of being a parent already um, to actual, actual relatives. Um, and, um, and obviously he was really, he was, he was the kind of person other people wanted to be around. It was, it was, um, um, other people wanted to, to look to him as a leader or a kind of parent, um, in, in other ways as a, as a, a, a parent of, a parent of this burgeoning community. Um, I think, um, you know, when you, when we think about that that period of time in history, um, post slavery, where you know constitutional amendments have been passed to to um, abolish slavery, to to create citizenship for for black men um, and voting rights for black men, um, and the surprise of slavery ending was was huge because for many people uh, they never really believed that that would happen. Um, and so there's this period of optimism, and I point, I point to um, the fact that for years in Washington D.C. there was an enormous parade celebrating emancipation. It's called the Emancipation Day Parade. Everybody came out, um, and it was it was a, a marker of celebrating their emancipation and 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 also celebrating the possibilities for what freedom could be. One of the the major features of this parade was. Um, a flower covered float featuring what was called the goddess of liberty, um, a woman, um, sometimes wearing a crown, who represented a black woman, who represented freedom, who represented the embodiment of freedom. Um, and she was often called the queen of freedom or the queen, um, which I think is an interesting um, correlation. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I, I pointed that sort of period, it's a, as a period of optimism, um, so as as sort of important to the idea, to, to this to the reality that you know in Washington D.C. in particular, it's a place that's attractive to formerly enslaved people. It's a place that provides some uh, job opportunities and other opportunities, opportunities to meet people, um, to build communities, to build friendships. Um, that that wasn't possible under the thumb of a slaveholder, you know. Um, how are you going to have a drag ball under the under the watchful eye of a dra of a of a slaveholder? Um, where where is it going to be held? Um, where are you going to get your costumes from? Um, all of these things are. You ask yourself. Well, um, of course, that's that's a limitation. It's a limitation on what's possible. And post-slavery, that's no longer a limitation. And so there's this, um, the creation of a, of a community is then possible for, for many people who, for whom it was not, was not possible in, in prior years. So there's an enthusiasm to meet each other, um, to, um, to build that community. And also another point, just to wrap it up, about families, um, enslaved people didn't have any control over what happened to their family members, right? So if you were a parent of an enslaved child, the slaveholder 
could sell that child for any reason at any time, no matter what you said or did. Um, um, you could be forced to carry a child that that um, that you didn't want to carry, um, either from an enslaved per, uh, child that was impregnated by an enslaved person, or uh, by your by your slaveholder or by some other white person um, um, who had access to your body. Um, you could. Um, the point is that, that that it was it was actually the idea of having a family um, that was had any cohesion uh, was really it was really difficult for many enslaved people and so um, you know I think the attraction of being able to build a family of people who understood what you were desiring and feeling in this time of optimism and in, in post war America is you know those are the ingredients for for building swan's community yeah thank you and you know to to go from that and uh, kind of expand a bit on on this idea of you know how we uh how we remember these stories and how they appear in the historical record you know i mean obviously we you know one of the main one of your main points of what you described when you encountered the story was like why is this not in the historical record so, you know, I'm just wondering um, if you could expand a bit on this, that, you know, you're making a very strong point that this is important for so many different histories, right? This is important mm -hmm. for like a rethinking of the history of queer emancipation, of queer activism. This is important for a rethinking of the history of African-American history. This is also important for the history, for the writing of US history in general. And like, how do you weave all these together? And maybe also, what are your hopes about like what this is going to do to maybe the historical account or how we how we think these stories? Also, because you know that <clears throat> yes, there's always this tendency, right, to marginalize these stories as exceptions. And mm -hmm. uh, and I find it really, really, really strong that you're making this point that you know this is not. A marginal history. This is a his. This is the history of the United States, and uh, and to to put this center stage, I think, is a very strong move. And maybe could you say a few more things about that? I have my motivations, right? My motivation, I think. Um, I think seeing yourself reflected in the people you learn about in history is really is a really important thing psychologically. And even spiritually for people, uh, and I and I point to the fact that you know in the United States there are there are many people there are organizations that are dedicated to reenacting Civil War battles. Um, that um, the reason they do that is because they take great pride in the fact that their ancestors um, were involved in some way, whichever side they were fighting on, their ancestors were fighting for something, they a cause they believed in. They know about that connection to themselves and they feel like a, a sense of, ah, I am part of, um, I'm part of the story of what built this country, what made this country what it is today. And in general, queer people often don't have that sense because we don't get taught uh, very much queer history, if any, in schools. Um, at, you know, there's California has 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 instituted um, um, some new lesson plans, um, and I've advised on that. You know, in recent years, but um, you know, when you and I were growing up, I don't know about you actually. When I was growing up, I didn't <laughs> I didn't learn anything about queer people at all, at all. Um, uh, you know, I I think I had I heard a heard something about um, later in high school through my own research, perhaps that Langston Hughes or James Baldwin were queer, but no details whatsoever about their lives in that realm, and um, and certainly not queer, queer figures from the Civil War. So um, I didn't learn about that, and I and I think I think us as queer people not having that, particularly black queer people not having that sense of connection to where we come from um, is uh, psychologically and, and 
um, spiritually, it feels like an, a sort of an injury. Like we feel like anomalies. Where did we, you know, we're, we're like, we're like the sort of, we're stuck on top, but we didn't come from anywhere. The real story of what America is, is these other people is, is the impression you get. And I want to combat that because I believe that it would help our, my community, the one that I'm a part of, the communities that I'm a part of, queer people and black people to, to, um, to feel differently about that to, and about themselves and about each other. Um, um there was another part of your question but i got sidetracked sidetracked on no that, that that's perfectly fine and you know i think you know that that is that is such a you know an important work that you're doing there and uh <clears throat> i think i don't even remember myself but i think part the, the other part of my question was that or maybe it was more of a comment you know that <clears throat> i i really think that you know just methodology like methodologically speaking you know it's really important to say that you know this is this is history, like as in the, these are the people, uh, you know, that that shaped history. And, um, you know, you do, you did hint at the fact that, you know, how how Swan and other people, you know, interacted with those figures that we now consider to be, you know, the important people who shaped uh, society, who shaped history. And, um, you know, there is always this tendency to to say there is like history writ large and then there is this the history of marginalized people or whatever. Mm -hmm. And and of course, you know, the story that you're telling takes place at so many intersections, right, of race, of class, of gender, of sexuality. And and to to really foreground that story as being at the center, you know, even geographically speaking, you know, that this is taking place speaking. like at the center of power. Um, I just find so um, so intriguing and so important. I think that was like, yeah, yeah. that's yeah, and and I love that that that's happening too because um, um, I think I, I just think it's very important to for this for this story for this history for Swan's story and for the history of queer Black people to 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 be as central as possible, um, you know. The story of Frances Thompson, for example, is not a story that's told about Reconstruction, about how Reconstruction started and how it ended. Uh, and yet she is central to that story. You know, her testimony before Congress about being sexually assaulted and then the unraveling of her reputation because of the, the Memphis police and, and her being assaulted again by them um leading to the unraveling of of reconstruction itself um to tell the story of reconstruction without including her in it is not factually uh complete let's put it that way so um so it, it's just i i want people to grasp the fact that the you know it, it's true that these are marginalized people but I don't want the history to be marginalized because the history is central to understand the full understanding of, of American history. Exactly. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And uh, and again, yeah, that that will then, you know, ideally that will have consequences in, you know, for how we think, uh, you know, contemporary politics and, you know, the like uh, contemporary civil rights movements, et cetera, that, you know, that it's not about it's not about this this mainstream versus marginalized, but it's really about like these are people at the center of what is happening. I have a quick comment to uh, to the audience because um, a question about that came up. Yes, please um, do ask questions in the Q and A section. Um, I'm going to do my best, uh, like starting in five minutes or so, to to include your questions, to bring your questions um, to Channing's attention, and we're going to include them in the discussion. Um, I just, um, I have uh, one more question, uh, like from this nexus of uh, how to approach history, and you've already mm -hmm. mentioned it, you know, that it, within queer historiography, especially, you know, there is this, uh, this really long and uh, uh, well discussed debate about how do we approach historically queer figures and what words do we use like how how do we avoid appropriating who they were for you know who we are now and because you know very often there will be a disjunct between you know the categories that we use um, and all the the different communities that that we have today and um, from what I understand your approach uh, seems to be and I think you know that that is like a great 
uh, that's a great idea to, you know, to, well, first of all, to use the term queer to really, um, you know, emphasize uh, kind of the, the, on the one hand, this inclusive genealogy of queer, a queer community, a queer history that we can still inscribe ourselves into, but without imposing certain categorizations. I, mean, I was just wondering, you know, um, not so much in ideological terms, but also, you know, in encountering your material and uh, in, you know, not like getting to know the context of the time, right, we're, we're just before the publication of Havelock Ellis's Sexual Inversion, which was kind of the first English speaking uh, sexological treatise on what we would now call homosexuality. So yeah, it was a, was a time where all these categories were shifting, uh, like on a discursive basis, but all, also at the same time, of course, they were just people living their lives and doing, doing uh, their, their things and, and being who they were. Um, and I was just, uh, yeah, curious to hear, like how, how did you navigate that or how, you, how have you been navigating that? It's quite a complicated and interesting uh, question, uh, which is um, how do you how do you name or identify people who didn't necessarily use the terms we use today? I mean, it's tricky because, for example, um, if you're doing um, you if you're explaining what you do to the average person, the way they will understand it is if you say oh, I do gay and trans history. <laughs> They'll get that because those words they understand. Um, uh, the history itself can be gay and trans, but the people themselves, it's much more complicated because um, when, you, when you get mired in the documents and, and in how they thought about themselves, how they thought about the communities they, were, they belonged in, and it varied quite a bit geographically and through time. Um, I think by imposing modern terms like LGBTQ, um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, non-binary, genderqueer, any of those terms, I think it closes off the possibility of understanding the unique ways they thought of themselves for the time. Um, and I don't want to erase the unique understandings of of people from each era that I am am trying to study, um, because they had really interesting ways of thinking about and categorizing themselves that we don't really have today. Um, you know, George Chauncey has a great um, section in in the the newer edition of his book, Gay America. Uh, sorry, um, uh, Gay New York. Um, where he talks about the idea of the fairy. You know, the fairy in early 20, in late 19th century, early 20th century, um, particularly in New York, um, was um, something between a gay man and a trans person. And the feminine, the feminine figure whose identity was also um, definitely male, but also definitely a certain kind of male. And and it, it inhabited it inhabited a space that that isn't claimed anymore, but that was very important for a certain period, you know, from 1890 to 1940 or so. Um, and uh, what's interesting for that period of time is that often pre World War II uh, there wasn't the category heterosexual versus homosexual socially. Oftentimes it was. I'm a normal man, I do normal man things. Essentially, I'm a top. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and that was considered, even if you were in a, there was a lot more tolerance if you were taking on the active role sexually in a relationship, in a same-sex relationship, um, than if you were taking on the passive role in, the, in that relationship. And, um, um, and so you had, uh, same sex relationships in which one was considered one person was considered a normal man, the other was considered a fairy, and the fairy was condemned, and the other man was co considered just to have been tempted by the fairy. Um, and I think Poor you guy. want to you want to know all of that in order to understand the social dynamics yeah. and how people think of themselves, and just imposing gay, trans, etc. I think it, it shuts out that discussion um, in a way that I think is is harmful to to the historical record 
and harmful to us really uh, really understanding you know um these really complicated people yeah i totally agree and i would also say you know it, it enriches it enriches the cultural history and even the, the the contemporary culture that that queerness embraces and um you know i i would actually say that it is um it's even you know productive in in political terms you know to to be aware of the of the complex and and diverse and and often not easy to categorize dynamics that you know over only the last 150 years of um, queer lives have um, brought about and uh, and there is so much value and beauty in that and I think uh, yeah and I think you're doing you know just as a compliment I think you're doing a really great work from what I've read in you know making making this history accessible in terms of uh, making it available for positive identification as a queer story, um, but at the same time not imposing something. It's um, a tough dance. It's a dance. You, you're doing a great <laughs> job. <laughs> you're a good dancer. Um, I think I want to try and and start including some of the questions from the audience. Um, so as uh, there's a first question, which is. Um, about uh, the historical context in which um, Swan was moving and existing and acting, and um, it's again a question that goes into the you know the uh, the intersectionality direction. And the question is that historically speaking, at the time, um, do we have evidence of separate communities of black and white queer people? And where, whether you know um, whether there is evidence of conflicts or activities of solid solidarity mm. between mm. the two. Um, uh, in Washington D.C., um, there was Swan's group. There's also um, evidence of queer people sort of, you know, hooking up. I mean. Um, that was sort of, I think, is that a standard thing to know about? I mean, yeah, there are people hooking up like in, in alleys and, and in, in the parks and so on, as you have today. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> um, but uh, as far as um, sort of community thinking type of organization, Swan was it, as far as anybody knew in Washington, D.C., uh, Swan's organization was the one that um, was discussed by journalists and, and also by by um, early psychiatrists at the time. Um, and uh, there was, uh, there was a, you know, there were groups in, um, in New York that we know about, which were um, essentially um, bars uh, that um, where, where fairies often were the performers were the entertainment. Um, in early bars like the Slide, uh, for example, in the Bowery in New York. Um, and um, what they were doing wasn't quite drag, but it but, um, and it wasn't quite community building in the same sense because it had this capitalist motivation. Um, but it is but it is also very interesting and um, an early um, an early sort of haven for for queer people. Um, uh, that was eventually sparked um, a backlash that you know that was reflected in newspaper condemnation and uh, and police raids and um, and 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 trials of various kinds. Um, so as far as conflict between groups, that's an interesting one because um, um, Swan's group um, basically consisted of, of men. Uh, women were, were not, I have no evidence that women were invited to, 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 to any of the events. Um, some men went to, went to the balls as men dressed in suits and others went um, dressed as, as women typically dressed at that time. Um, and uh, the, what the interesting fact is most of them were black, most of them were formerly enslaved people. Um, a few um, um, sort of notable people were white. Um, not much is known about the white folks who attended, but the white folks who attended, in at least one case, were pitted against the black black uh, people 
um, after a raid uh, led to led to serious char charges that led to a trial. So the white the white attendees of the ball were given clemency if they testified against Swan and others um, um, for holding the ball. So there was there was definitely a, a, a racial wedge that was possible um, even then. Um, I, I do think that the the presence of even a small number of white people at that time, given the the highly highly separated, segregated, polarized racial climate of that era in particular, strongly suggests that there was not an opportunity for for white people in, in D.C. to ex experience something similar. Which is interesting in itself, right? Uh, that there there wasn't like a white alternative or whatever, and that this emerged from a black community and out of a black context. Yeah. I only know, I mean, personally, because, uh, you know, most of the, I know sometimes, sometimes I know more about Great Britain than I know about the US. And I know that there, um, mm -hmm. Alan Bray is an historian who's looked into um, these kinds of cross-dressing communities in the mm -hmm. 18th century, even earlier in, in, mm -hmm. in London. Uh, mm -hmm. where, I mean, that would have been mostly white people who come together and cross-dress. And again, like, it's a bit unclear like, what the meaning of that then is and how in mm -hmm. how far same-sex desire um, plays a role. But um, as in, you know, there are, of course, historical predecessors, but, uh, or, you know, similar activities. But as you say, mm -hmm. I mean, what, what is so interesting about Swan's case and Swan's entourage is that, you know, he becomes, like, this becomes so outspoken and kind of, really proto-activist in a sense um, mm -hmm. that, that I uh, I hadn't heard of before. So mm -hmm. that's, that's really, yeah. You know, there's been uh, various types of cross-dressing throughout millennia. Uh, yeah. We call it cross-dressing. A person assigned one, one gender socially is dressing as the other for <clears throat> social purposes, religious purposes, um, cultural purposes, um, exactly. just for fun. Yeah. Um, and they're all really different and have different histories and different meanings in each in each context. So it's sort of it's easy to assume that they're all the same, but actually they're all really interesting and really different. Yeah. I mean, what I also find interesting in this case is that, you know, if you think of the element of class of the examples that I know, I mean, this probably also has to do with the historical source material that we have. But very often there seems to be this implication that um you know cross-dressing cross-dressers historical cross-dressers who also you know would be able to 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 do that um uh would very often be you know pretty far up in the in the class hierarchy mm -hmm. or have a lot of money mm -hmm. um, which is not the case here right mm -hmm. um, and and these people <laughs> exactly and these people would be exposed mm -hmm. to uh to to all this violence and uh yeah um, I want to I want to include like an, another question. Um, mm. This is um, this is about the um, the media and the sources that that you're working with. And the, the question comes from a fellow journalist. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, um, this person's wondering what you found in the media at the time, both white and black press. What was and was what was not reported. Um, mm -hmm. What uh, do you read in the white space between the lines, mm -hmm. and what does that re this reflect about um, the attitudes at the time? I was wondering about a similar thing, also, you know, in in terms of like media reports as like this ambivalent source of, on the one hand, you know, it's it's uh, it makes an historical existence visible. On the other hand, very often it will be you know slandering or negative reporting. So, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. um... <coughs> Excuse me. I tend to use my newspaper sources as sort of evidence for for the existence of other sources, um, and so I begin. You know, I look at what the newspaper source says. Um, does it give an address? Does it give a, a a unique name that might appear might be easier to find elsewhere in a in a census or a, or a directory? Um, does it provide a time period where an event occurred? Does it mention a prior event? Does it, uh, you know, where did the event happen? Um, where can I locate it on a map? What's nearby on that map? Um, th those are like all potential ways to build out, um, you know, the the evidence of of things that are sort of 
glimpses sometimes in, in the newspaper record um, um, that you want to know more about. Um, as far as, you know, the newspaper coverage was generally negative. Um, even the even the medical journal reports about Swan and, and other people considered sexual deviants was always condemn, condemning and um, moralistic. It, it, it did not have the, the sort of separation between like the scientific view um, and the moral view that we were used to seeing today. Um, every single uh, report that I read from the time sort of throws all sexual deviants into the same bucket. So sex outside of marriage, female orgasms, um, bestiality, ped uh, ped pedophilia, um, all of that goes in the same bucket and it's all condemned. Um, and um, so that's that's very common. Um, and another thing just about the, the coverage. Um, so, you know, I think oftentimes this coverage existed because it was amusing. It was, you know, oh, look at these people, what they're doing. How amusing. Oh, how, how amusing and terrible, right? I mean, it wasn't amusing in this, like, it wasn't treated in this kind of flippant way. It was sort of like, um, these people need to be stopped in what they're doing. There was this concept, um, there was this concept that, that that was present at the time. It's a related thing. It doesn't quite address the question, but I think it's important. So there was there was all this discussion during the Civil War about fighting for Black manhood. Now, when I first saw that, I thought they mean humanity. They mean humanity. They're just using manhood in this in this general way. You know, um, they didn't. They meant manhood. They meant manhood. Um, the this idea that if you were fighting in the Civil War on the Union side, you were fighting for the right of Black men to take their proper place in society as men, as the leader of their household, um, as the as the as you know the, the king the king of their domain and so on. Um, uh, that's what that's how it was talked about as fighting for manhood. Um, the uh, oftentimes suffrage was described, you know, the voting rights was described as manhood suffrage, meaning all men get voting rights. Um, so there was this concept that was operative at that time that the civil war was fought over black manhood and uh, black men's right to be men. And the police of Washington, DC were all required to have been military people. There was a crazy law that said that you had to be a, a veteran of the, of the military to be a police officer. So many officers at the time had fought in the Civil War. So they had actually fought in the Civil War with this under this banner of fighting for Black manhood. So imagine having that concept and being confronted with Black men in dresses, totally an, an insult. It would have been an insult to their 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 um, their sensibility about about um, not only about how black men should be, but an insult you know, to their, to their uh, endangering their own lives and fighting, fighting for um, that concept um, on the battlefields. Mm. Um, so I think that's an important, I don't know, context, contextual thing to think about when you think about the, the ways that, um, the ways that media and other people um, to con sought to condemn so what's their motivation for condemning it? Right. It's, it's, it's in part that this very uh, rigid concept of patriarchy, but also this idea that didn't we fight for the right for them to be men? <laughs> what, are, what are they doing? Um, um, yeah, and uh, you know, reading between the lines was another part of the question. Um, it's difficult to give a specific example of reading between the lines because you, I find you have to, to, you have to read so many documents in order to have enough information to make an educated guess of something that isn't actually overtly said. Um, you know, if you've read a thousand documents, you might be able to say, well, you know, and reading these thousand documents from very different places, I, I hear this word repeated over and over again. 
or I never hear anybody talking about this, right? So only in in doing that can you can you can you I think reliably read between the lines. You've got to talk. It's it's never on the basis of a single document that you're reading between the lines. Thanks. That's not how I do it anyway. Maybe just to to go on from this because this this is something that I was also wondering about. Um, or that I'm curious about, and I've got to read some uh, some parts of what's going to be the book. Um, in terms of you know your method as a writer, so you you use all this source material that you've got, and you call your book a uh, a narrative biography, right? And you said mm -hmm. earlier that um, you know you're about your journalist, you're about mm -hmm. telling uh, compelling stories. And again, I think you're doing a great job there. So a lot of it is very you know it's a it's a story. It, there's suspense there. Um, yeah. You structure it in a certain way that you really want to know what's going to happen next. Um, so <laughs> I, I just want, I want people to read it. Yeah, well, that I, I mean, <laughs> that's I think what you know. We in academia always, you know, we know no one's ever going to read it. Um, anyway, so question would be um, like how how do you go about that? Like how do you find? you know, this balance between, okay, this is what I have in the source material, and, you know, I mm -hmm. want to be historically accurate, of course, but at the same time, you know, it is about telling a story, and you do sometimes, um, which is, you know, an established method, I know this from other, from other books, of course, and from other authors that, you know, you do use, like, your imagination, you know, to think about how could this scene have played out? Um, could you talk a bit more about that? Mm -hmm. Um, I think you use imagination in, in any form of history because you've got to use your imagination and personal judgment as the person that's looking at actually looking at the documents. You've got to, you, you know better than anybody else because you've, you've seen whatever particular documents you're looking at. You've seen them, you understand them better than anybody. So you've got to trust yourself to be able to interpret them. Those documents are, are always contradictory, incomplete, um, you've got to decide what which fact seems more if two documents contra contradict each other you've got to decide which one is more reasonable to you which one seems like it's probably right um um something that's you know as far as the absences from from the documentary record um you have two choices you can take extra time to keep looking for the fact somewhere else and um that's why that's one reason why my research has taken so long because you think, you know, I have to know this particular thing. There's no way I can keep going without knowing that. So you, you can, you know, you can, um, it could be something like, what was the weather on that day or what were they wearing on that night or um, various other questions. Um, and you've got, you know, I've, I've become obsessed with some of trying to figure some of those things. Is there any evidence or any suggestion anywhere of, of, that I could point to as documentation? um of this thing i'm trying to say um and of course you tell the reader where you got that documentation so they can check on you um and if they have their own interpretation they can write another book um <laughs> if they want <laughs> um and uh but as far as um you know how do i create a narrative and how do i create suspense and all that i i just look at the material i have and i and i say okay this is the material i have what's the most compelling story that I can construct from this material? Rather than saying, I want to construct this really compelling story. How can I fit the material into it? I think that's the wrong way because that's the that's where you get into the problem of making things up and or wanting to make things up. Thank you. Uh, speaking of finding out how these people dressed up, um, there is a question from the audience about um, the socioeconomic uh, situation and environment of Swan's community. And uh, this person's wondering about how could so many people afford, uh, you know, silk and satin dresses for the balls? And uh, was Swan personally uh, economic, uh, economically independent? Um, how did they, like, where did they meet? Like, did they own houses, etc.? Swan... Uh, was at various times a janitor, uh, a coach driver, which means he, he drove, uh, he, he took care of horses and, and, and drove a coach with a horse. Um, uh, sometimes a butler, sometimes he helped out his brother and sister with, with the sewing work that they were doing. So they were not, uh, were not wealthy people. 
Um, and uh, his employers actually talked about how what little money he made, he often shared it with his family. So there's an easy answer to how people got the, the dresses. They stole them. <laughs> <laughs> or they stole the materials and, um, and you know, sewed them together. Yeah, the, there is a wonderful, just uh, if I can, if I can may share this, there is this wonderful anecdote in the part that I read where the Washington police wonder about the cases of women's underwear being stolen from the, <laughs> from the, the lines outside the houses and they just cannot figure out what's happened to the laundry because they just lack the imagination <laughs> that it might be men needing that underwear to, you know, dress to the occasion. Um, I think uh, that, that was a wonderful story. Um, there is um, a question about the legacy of, uh, of Swan and, um, and his, uh, well, his culture, his balls, um, specifically about um, Harlem Renaissance writers. Mm -hmm. And the question is, like, were they still aware of Swan? And um, how, much, uh, how much did some, especially some of the gay male writers associate with um, that legacy, or did they build on that legacy? Were they aware of it at all? Uh, <clears throat> I don't have um, any documentation that Harlem Renaissance writers were discussing Swan in particular, although many of them described attending balls in Harlem. Um, there, uh, one important journalist who, who wrote for the Baltimore African American, Afro American newspaper, um, was Ralph Matthews, and he actually um, his coverage is sort of mixed in terms of how judgmental he can be. Oftentimes, it's very judgmental, but he was one of the most prominent journalists who made a point of actually writing about attending and writing about balls that were happening not only in Harlem, but also um, Baltimore, Washington, DC, and other, other places. Um, so we think of Harlem Renaissance balls as happening in Harlem, but the, the Harlem Renaissance balls were happening um, in many places across the East Coast. Um, and Matthews uh, was, is, is one person who sort of acknowledges the, the lineage um, uh, by you know, in his coverage describing how balls began as um, private, you know, private events in people's homes, and you know, and by the late twenties and thirties, there, um, there are these public events which are, which are essentially giving sanction to something that used to be a, a, a secret, a family shame. Um, so he's pointing, he points out this lineage, its earlier lineage in local private balls and describes their expansion into public events as a kind of, um, you know, as and he decries it because he thinks that what a shame that these people are corrupting all of, all of us now. Um, but in, in, that, in, that, in that effort to condemn, um, he's also one, interest, one important link back to, um, to earlier days. Um, um, Swan died uh, basically in obscurity. Um, so you know, after not getting, after not getting the presidential pardon that he had requested, and after becoming essentially, you know, news reports all over Washington about about um, about his case, um, it would have been difficult to to retain uh, employment in the same way that he had before, and um, also his parents were had been getting older and. Anyway, there, there were many reasons for him to sort of take a different tack in life. But um, you do see in, you know, very quickly in uh, as Swan leaves DC, um, returns to his small hometown, you see um, other, what appear to be, you know, younger groups of, of, of queens uh, sort of taking up the mantle. Um, and that continues, you know, to the point in 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 the, the 20s where uh, where in Washington and Baltimore people are are um, advertising balls and the public begins to attend them.
Thanks. Um, uh, like tying into this question of how much can we still know about this, and uh, again more broadly about the material that you used. Uh, so you've spoken a lot about the um, the journalistic material and the the newspapers, but uh, there is a question from the audience um, whether. Um, you know what the archive of legal and police records is that mm -hmm. might be available to these, especially mm -hmm. the raids, the arrests, mm -hmm. the charges, the penalties, mm -hmm. etc. And did you also look into that? And how much can we, uh, how much information can we get from from this kind mm -hmm. of source? Um, so some of that stuff is in the National Archives. If you want to go and look at it, um, so um i spent quite a quite a long time in the national archives many trips actually to dc to do just that and um so the police records from that time are really spotty some of the stuff is just lost um what does exist though sometimes is um uh records of who was arrested and when and what they were arrested for um um, you get sometimes trial records. Um, you get sometimes, uh, you know, if you know what you're looking for, you can sometimes find trial records. <coughs> the District of Columbia Archives also has arrest records. So that's an that was an interesting, also very difficult to do research there because the records are not organized in a way that makes any sense. And you have to, you know, make an appointment and and um, sit in a little room and look through <laughs> things with gloves on. Um, um, and that was an interesting place, though, because there I found some great, great stuff uh, about sort of Frederick Douglass's role in, in, um, in the community. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, there, there are records, there are police records available, criminal records, um, very few trial records, though. There's some police records and some prison records, jail records, um, but you have to move move heaven and earth to be willing to move heaven and earth to get to them. In my experience, maybe they're easier. I, you know, I doubt it, but maybe they're maybe they're getting easier to access um, after you know now that I've asked for the for the records so many times. Thank you. <laughs> um, before we come to an end, I want to ask two questions. The first question you can uh, you can answer them both like at the same time. The first question will be, when is the book coming out? Um, and the other question is, um, it's already set to be turned into a film. And I was just wondering, you know, whether you could give us a bit of a teaser of, um, do, do you already know, like, how is that going to translate? What do you, what is your feeling of like, why, like, what's this story going to? How's this gonna story gonna uh, translate to the to the big screen and um, and uh, yeah, how did that happen? <laughs> so um, here's what I can say. So I spoke to my my editor yesterday, um, and uh, so we're hoping the book will come out next year. Um, so that's let's keep your fingers crossed that that happens and. Um, um, you know, and as far as the film interests and so on, um, you know, I have a wonderful agent, um, uh, a creative artist, and, and she has worked really hard to get my early proposals out to various Hollywood people. Um, and so she's she's amazing and um, and that's that she's the reason. <laughs> and um, I would say uh, about that that I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully this film happening because I want um, I want to reach an audience that I know won't ever read a book no matter how good <laughs> you know I want I, I do think this story is important and I want um, I want it to reach a wide uh, sort of a wide public so thank you so much. Um... Thanks for, for discussing um, this, uh, your work with me and uh, thanks to the audience for um, sharing your questions and um, thank you for being here. And with that, um, I'll hand over back to Birit. 
Thank you so much, uh, Geo and Channing, for a fascinating discussion, um, which could have lasted at least two more hours, I would say, um, given uh, given the fascination that we all had. Um, however, we have to end. We will, I think, um, we would be uh, taking the rest of the questions and perhaps Channing is willing to answer them via email. <laughs> no pressure, Channing. <laughs> um, Tomorrow, um, you're all kindly invited uh, to um, to watch the next Academy event online. Anthony Durr will read from his newest book, uh, Cloud Cuckoo Land, which uh, will be um, coming out as a, with a German translation tomorrow as Wolkenkuckucksland. Um, thank you all so much for coming. And uh, thank you again, Geo and Channing. Um, and perhaps Channing, I see you in a minute in the building. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye.